hello, everybody. I'm Kelly Egan. Um, I'm going to, sorry, make the video smaller so I'm not distracted by faces. My name is Kelly Egan. I'm faculty in the University of Wisconsin Addiction Medicine um, Fellowship Program. I'm relatively new. I started in April um, this year, shortly after COVID hit. So needless to say, it's been a, a strange time to join a new community, but um, going really well. And I'm going to talk today about a lot of the work that I did in San Francisco before I came to Madison. So um, I worked in San Francisco for 12 and a half years, um, including my residency, which I did in family medicine at UCSF. And then I uh, worked for the Department of Public Health from the time I graduated residency until this past January. Um, and I was a primary care doctor um, and but, and the work that I did related to hepatitis C was a really big part of my experience there. So I was going to share this story and um, hope that people um, learn from it and take some ideas away that we can continue here locally. So I have no financial disclosures. I only must disclose that this is not my work and my story alone. This is really the story of a city and the story of many people who worked hard on a effort together. Um, and I have much gratitude to all those people. Um, so going back, I said I did residency at UCSF. I finished residency in 2011 and I want, knew I wanted to work with um, urban populations. And so I, I stayed in San Francisco and I started working for the Department of Public Health. Um, and I got a job working at this small shoebox of a clinic in the um, heart of downtown San Francisco, neighborhood called the Tenderloin. Um, and it's a neighborhood that has a very high prevalence of people experiencing homelessness, uh, people with substance use disorders and mental health. And so I was working at this clinic called Housing and Urban Health. Um, it was initially created as a clinic where people who were formerly homeless and had been moved into permanent supportive housing could get their care. So we had an interesting model aiming to um, really tailor care to people with um, comorbid mental health and substance use disorders who had been homeless. Um, but homelessness is a very dynamic existence. And so we had people who were both in permanent supportive housing as well as on the streets and in shelters. And I was, of course, taking care of kind of all the chronic diseases that we see in Americans, often um, with um, less good control than other patients might have because of resources or healthcare access. Uh, but one of the common themes that kept coming up was hepatitis C. Um, patients that I was taking care of had high uh, significant risk factors for hep C acquisition. And so I was just seeing a lot of hepatitis C and pretty much all untreated hepatitis C. Now, this was 2011, early 2012. Um, and my supervisor, uh, Josh Bamberger, who's another fellow family medicine doctor, was really interested in bringing treatment for hepatitis C into our clinic, um, but didn't feel he had the bandwidth himself. And so he sort of asked and tasked me to take this on. And, and that's where the story started. I was um, very eager, didn't have a lot of commitments in my personal or professional life and decided to jump in head first to this um, idea of treating hepatitis C, which at the time was still um, quite novel in the primary care setting. Um, it was still before the days of our new drugs. So we were using um, the injectable medication called interferon, which was not a particularly tolerable or effective medication. Um, and I um, worked with a nursing student. We did a small um, qualitative survey um, talking to patients about barriers to hepatitis C. And this quote was one of the most poignant, um, both sad, but also perhaps inspiring quotes that came out of that work. Um, and one of the patients said, they don't treat people like me. I'm, I don't even honestly remember who this was or what the like me meant, but I could imagine like me with mental health, like me with um, substance use disorder, like me who doesn't have a place to stay, like me whose you know, skin looks a different color than yours. But for all these many reasons, patients were getting turned away for hepatitis C treatment. So I have some slides about hepatitis C in general. I think most people on this call probably know a good deal about this disease. But um, just some basic facts. So in 2018, the last time the CDC published a full surveillance report, it was estimated that 2.4 million people live with hepatitis C. This may be a gross underestimation. We know that testing is not ideal. Um, and we know that over half or at least half of people don't know they're infected. So while not a pandemic, we surely have an epidemic. Um, I'm including this, uh, I'm talking about work in California and you can see California is pretty light blue. 
Um, and but I wanted to call attention to Wisconsin here, which um, is dark blue, which means these are acute uh, rates of acute hepatitis C. So perhaps a call to action for all of us here in Wisconsin um, that there's more we could be doing about hepatitis C um, treatment and uh, cure. Some basic facts about hepatitis C infection. So hepatitis C is a viral infection that can cause chronic liver disease. From the time somebody's infected, um, through blood transmission, um, they go through a period of acute infection, and most people don't have any symptoms, so they often will not know they've been infected. Um, about maybe 20 to 30 percent will display some degree of symptoms. Um, about 15 to 20 percent of those people will spontaneously clear the virus on their own, but the vast majority go on to be chronically infected. If they're going to clear, they're going to clear within the first generally six months. Um, so if infected past six months, you can assume this person is going to be chronically infected. Um, and for a long time, we convinced people hepatitis C like wasn't that bad. Like, you know, you, you weren't having symptoms and, you know, we're monitoring your liver by doing liver function testing periodically. Um, and in reality, we didn't have a lot we could do at that time. This is before the newest agents that we currently use to treat hepatitis C. In reality, people have a lot of symptoms with hepatitis C infection, but they're often fairly vague, nonspecific, fatigue, muscle aches, fogginess of the brain. Um, sometimes they have kidney dysfunction or skin manifestations, but a lot of this could be chalked up to potentially other things. Um, and so people often live with chronic hepatitis. They may or may not know that they have it. They may or may not feel that they have it. Um, and I like to think of things kind of in a rule of 20. So about 20% of people will develop cirrhosis, which is scarring of the liver in about 20 years. That will happen more quickly if you have other problems with your liver, um, including co-infection with, with hepatitis B or HIV, if you have um, problems with alcohol use and many other things. For the people who develop cirrhosis, um, about 50% go on, I'm sorry, um, some go on to develop decompensated cirrhosis, which is also called liver failure, perhaps. It might be something you've heard of called that way. Um, and then a small percentage go on to develop liver cancer, but not insignificant. And both liver failure and liver cancer are very deadly and high cost um, diseases with significant morbidity. Um, we used to do risk-based testing. And so these were the risk factors associated with hepatitis C, namely anything that brought you into contact with somebody else's blood. Infection drug use, I'm sorry, injection drug use as well as this idea of being born in the baby boomer cohort, um, were often two of the biggest factors identified. It's important to acknowledge, especially um, as an addiction medicine provider, that intranasal drug use is a transmission risk factor as well. Um, so we often used to kind of say, like, do any of these apply to you? If so, let's test you. But in March of just this year, the United Services Preventive U.S. Preventative Services Task Force um, issued guidelines recommending universal screening, and that's largely coming from that early slide where I said most people don't know they have it, or half of the people don't know they have it. We're not doing a good enough job based on risk-based testing alone. So we now recommend that all adults be tested at least once in their lifetime or more, more frequently with ongoing risks. This slide just quickly speaks to really we have a bimodal distribution in our new cases of hepatitis C. So on the right, you see older individuals falling into that baby boomer cohort. That's, you know, the idea that people were often infected 20, 30 years ago and have lived with this maybe unknown for many years. But that peak on the left, that is our young population. And many of those infections or most of those infections are being driven by the opioid and substance use epidemics in our country. So there's really two very different populations and um, effective treatment and engagement with these populations can look very different. Um, it's more common in men than women, but really we see the bimodal peak in both populations. So why do we care? You know, I said before, we told people, oh, you're doing fine. We're monitoring your liver, you're okay. Well, the reality is, is hepatitis C has incredible morbidity and mortality. Overall, two times all mortality um, risks. Um, we know it's higher risk if you have another co-infection like hepatitis B or HIV, if you have other forms of liver disease, if you use alcohol heavily, or if you are um, of a minority population who may experience other health disparities. Um, I used to say that hepatitis C was the top indication for liver transplantation. That was true until recently when NASH and alcohol disorders uh, surpassed hepatitis C as the indication for liver transplant. 
Um, and that's really only because we are now able to cure and we are curing enough people to prevent transplant. So that's a good thing, uh, but still not, um, not to be dismissed. And then we know that 50% of cases of hepatocellular carcinoma are related to hepatitis C. In 2012, something fairly remarkable happened, and that was that deaths from hepatitis C alone surpassed deaths from 60 other infectious diseases combined. And that included, notably, HIV, hepatitis B, and tuberculosis, um, which are diseases with high mortality rates, all things considered. So pretty remarkable, and this really caught people's eye. I was living in San Francisco at the time where um, we had really you know, high prevalence of HIV, and you know, the HIV epidemic is, HIV is now a chronic disease that you can live with um, and really have very minimal effects on your life. But hepatitis C at that time, people were still dying and dying at increasing rates. Um, pretty remarkable to see how many people are dying from this disease. This is what's called a cascade of care. If you're um, familiar with the HIV cascade of care theory, it's really looking at sort of all comers. So thinking about that 2.4 million the CDC predicted or uh, estimated from 2018. If you take all those people who are viremic and they live with hepatitis C, they're saying here only 36% of them know they're infected. So again, that kind of less than half or not even half. And then of those people, we know that you know only 11% of people as of 2018 had been treated. Um, so that's a very small percent. We're talking about a tenth of the population with the disease have been given or have access to treatment. Now, the really good news is, is that if you look, there's 11% who were treated in 2018 and 11% were cured. If you actually do the math, that's a nine, you know, looking at the gross numbers, that's 95% cure rate. But really, we know the good thing is, is that if you can get treatment to people, it's very effective and they will be cured. Um, so obviously, though, a lot of work to be done here between the people living with the disease and those who are cured. So going back to me, 2012, um, like I said, I'm eager and I'm like willing to do anything that people ask me to do at the time. <laughs> um, and it, it honestly seemed like it was a very compelling idea that I could um, try to treat my own patients. It was obviously one of the one of the big things that people wanted and couldn't access. And so I was connected with two really inspiring and remarkable physicians in San Francisco who were HIV providers. Uh, the idea of treating hepatitis C outside of the specialty setting um, or outside of the hepatology world really started in the world of HIV, um, recognizing, again, that many people living with HIV are co-infected with hepatitis C because of co-occurring risk factors. Um, so I connected to these two doctors, and I started treating patients. Um, so I started initially with uh, interferon-based regimens, which I mentioned earlier, and interferon is uh, it's a drug that's used for a variety of conditions, it really just kind of like squelches the immune system. And so the idea would be that um, or it squelches the virus and allows the immune system to, to effectively respond better, um, but highly toxic, um, often sort of from a side effect profile compared to chemotherapy. Um, and then it was used in conjunction with ribavirin, again, a very nonspecific agent. And this combination had been shown that it could cure hepatitis C in some people. But we were talking about cure rates of like 40 to 50 percent in certain populations with very significant toxicity um, and morbidity associated with the treatment. Um, now, two, a really important thing happened shortly after I started this work. Um, and that was that in May of 2011, the first, quote, direct acting antivirals were FDA approved. And so rather than just using these sort of nonspecific agents that um, people were kind of it's like throwing the, you know, throwing the, what's the saying, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, it's not quite right. But, you know, we were just trying to like throw anything at the virus initially, hoping that it would cure. And that was the approach with interferon and ribavirin. But in 2011, these direct acting antivirals that actually acted on different points of the replication cycle were approved by the FDA. Now, initially, they still had to be used with interferon. So it didn't really help that toxicity concern, but they were significantly more effective, at least. Um, and then in 2000, very late 2013, the first all oral regimen was FDA approved, meaning that we could finally get rid of interferon. Um, and that was really the game changer. So as of January 2014, clinicians were suddenly handed new agents that could be 
used with very high efficacy rates, very minimal toxicities, all things considered, and all oral. And so that was really the game changer. And so it was serendipitous that I was involved in this work and um, was learning from people who really understand the, wor the world of viral, you know, viruses with HIV and antiviral medications, was able to learn alongside those people. And so um, I was treating my own patients in my very small primary care clinic. Uh, the clinic was as wide as you see the pictures in this, <laughs> the, the windows in this picture, and only about twice as deep, a uh, very small little place. So I was treating my own patients, and then I started treating my colleagues. So, you know, somebody who saw the other PCT at my clinic, I would start seeing them and treat them as well. We had a very, um, a very strong model um, that we used in our clinic to support medication adherence. Um, we were treating a large percentage of people who lived with HIV, and so we had a program where patients could come in anywhere between daily and five days a week to pick up medications directly from our nurses. So we were capitalizing on that to have patients come in, you know, every day or every two two days or something like that to help support their adherence to these medications and allow us to monitor them more closely. Um, so um, around the same time, I I was connected to this woman, Katie Burke. Um, and she was actually a friend of a childhood friend. Um, and she was new at her job with the Department of Public Health. Um, she was tasked with doing a needs assessment for all activities related to hepatitis C. And she had largely been focusing on sort of the epidemiology, the testing strategy, the linkage to care. And, and she was very clear that like, you know, even if we do better at testing, there are not many people treating this disease in San Francisco, especially not among the populations that are most affected. Um, and she and I met and we started talking um, and we were also talking with this other woman, Annie Luca Meyer, who's a HIV doctor, one of the people sort of who mentored me initially in this work. And in 20, June of 2015, the city of San Francisco put forth um, a strategic direction paper um, laying out strategies for um, tackling the hepatitis C epidemic in San Francisco. And it was as Katie Burke was working on this document and Annie, Katie, and I were meeting together that we started to think about could hepatitis C really be eliminated? I will say that um, Annie Lukemeyer in particular is somebody who thinks very, very big. I'm a rule follower and I'm the practical one. And I would say, but but I don't know that that's going to work. Um, and I think, you know, both her her forward thinking and my practicality probably was a good match together because it allowed us to to make change and make progress. So we started thinking about like, could hepatitis C be eliminated? We didn't even really think about what that meant per se, but you know, why did we start thinking that was possible? First of all, you know, the morbidity and the mortality was evident. Um, and these new medications that I talked about, it made it possible for virtually everyone to be cured and not only cured, but cured with minimal toxicity, you know, short course of treatment. Um, we, there's data to suggest that everyone, both people who have severe liver disease and people who have maybe no evidence of um, significant liver disease benefit from cure. Um, and then most importantly, as we knew from the HIV world, that treating hepatitis C was a means of preventing hepatitis C because this is a bloodborne and infectious pathogen. And so treating people at biggest risk for transmission would effectively prevent and help us move towards elimination. So then we started, you know, I think we started talking about elimination. And then at some point people were asking us, well, like if you're gonna eliminate hepatitis C, like how many cases are there? Like how many do you have to treat? Where do we have to do this? And you know, at this point, our ranks were growing. We were working with more people within the Department of Public Health and UCSF, and we realized we really had no idea. <laughs> that was the embarrassing moment, one of probably many embarrassing moments. But San Francisco had very poor data on um, hepatitis C. And so over the course of about two years, um, we gathered a group of people, primarily people in like the public health and epidemiology worlds, um, including some researchers from UCSF who, you know, triangulated data, worked across health systems, trying to get access to data from different large health systems, in addition to the Department of Public Health, um, and put together the first prevalence estimate for the city of San Francisco. So estimating that we had about 22,000 people who were seropositive, meaning they had a positive hepatitis C antibody, um, which represented about 2.5% of the population. Um, which in comparison to the rest of the country um, is higher than the estimated 1.4 prevalence. 
Uh, but again, not everybody who has a positive antibody lives with active hepatitis C. Some have been cured and some have been cleared spontaneously. So our prevalence estimate also estimated that about 12,000 people were living with the virus at that time. And this um, was a huge accomplishment um, because it really allowed us to think about, you know, who are we talking about? How many? Where do these people live? What are their risk factors? Um, and the data was published in 2017 and plus one. Also, as part of this prevalence estimate, we dug deeper into who was really bearing the brunt of the epidemic. And unsurprisingly, um, vulnerable populations were where we saw the greatest impact. So people living with um, people who inject drugs made up 68% of the pop 68% of the cases, despite the fact they make up 3% of the population of San Francisco. Um, and similarly, men who have sex with men uh, made up a larger percentage than they are across the general population, and similarly, baby boomers. Um, and then staggeringly, um, transgender women, approximately one in every six transgender women in San Francisco was living with hepatitis C. Um, there was some good news along that line in that there was a lot of very active work to eliminate hepatitis C among the transgender population in San Francisco. Um, not going to go into the numbers on this slide, but the um, items highlighted in red, um, I think, are important factors that are not unique to San Francisco, but perhaps um, somewhat unique um, in that there's a very large population of people who inject drugs, um, a very large percentage of people who live with HIV, as well as people experiencing homelessness. And San Francisco also has the highest rate of liver cancer in the United States, not entirely due to hepatitis C. Um, there's quite a, a prevalence of hepatitis B from um, populations immigrating from Asian countries as well, driving that. But, um, you know, just a lot of reasons why this was a compelling um, idea for us. So why was it possible, um, you know, like I said, we were thinking big about elimination, but we were also trying to be realistic. So first of all, San Francisco is itty bitty. In my time here in Madison, I've realized um, how fortunate we were to have geography on our side. San Francisco is only seven by seven miles in its entirety. It's both a city and a county. It's a peninsula. So, you know, there's really nothing outside those seven by seven. Um, people we were taking care of lived in very close proximity to the healthcare organizations where they were getting their care. Um, there's a very strong public health infrastructure and private health infrastructure um, with, you know, historically strong um, services for HIV and for drug user health, as well as a general safety net health system for primary care. Uh, the Medicaid coverage in California was excellent. It, it did get better over time. Initially, it was not quite as comprehensive, uh, but overall we had great access to medications, which was not universal in other states. And then um, we have a really um, unique population of providers. I think the HIV epidemic and the substance use epidemics in San Francisco have um, really grown a population of healthcare providers who are compassionate towards people um, affected by this disease and very skilled in engaging the population. And so we were, we were well poised to do this if we were able to do it. Uh, but barriers, there were many, um, housing status being one, the stigma associated with hepatitis C, tremendous. Um, a lot of our younger population living with hepatitis C had very limited engagement with healthcare systems. Um, you know, while we had good coverage to meds in general, there were some key gaps, including paid people incarcerated. Um, and while we had committed providers, most of the providers knew nothing about how to actually treat the disease. So they theoretically could do it, but didn't really know how. Um, and then again, our data was awful. <laughs> and even now is not great, I'll admit. Um, it was something we really struggled with because the idea of elimination is hard to do if you don't have data to drive. Um, and so Annie, Katie, and I, and over time, other people joining our, our team, we put together this self-sustaining entity called NHEP CSF. So NHEP CSF is an organization um, that is comprised of individuals from many different um, institutions and organizations across San Francisco. It's not a work group for the Department of Public Health. It's not a UCSF committee. Um, it really was comprised of people across all um, walks of life and professional organizations in San Francisco. And um, we founded this in 20, 2016 
um, with the ideas really taking root in 2014-2015. And we envisioned that San Francisco would be a place where hepatitis C was no longer a public health threat and where health inequities from hepatitis C had been eliminated. Um, and this logo on the right is just sort of one of the many um, things we put together over the years and all the spokes um, are components, not, not all of the components, but many of the components that we envisioned were necessary to bring together to imagine a San Francisco without significant hepatitis C. Um, at our core, um, we envisioned this as um, believing that all people living with hepatitis C deserve cure, that everyone living with or at risk for hepatitis C should have access to prevention services and care for their disease. Uh, really fundamental was the idea that um, wisdom must come from those most impacted. Um, healthcare providers often have intelligence and wisdom as well, but often don't have the lived experience. And so really at its core was the importance of community engagement and consumer engagement. Um, we really aimed to engage populations that have been characterized historically as difficult to treat. And also sort of at its core was recognition that you're not, you can't just cure hepatitis C um, to solve the problem. You have to be addressing um, co-occurring health disparities that this population, that these populations experience. So as we started to think about developing this, this entity, bringing together people from all different organizations, um, you know, really what we recognized was there was really great potential in San Francisco. There was huge need because we had an epidemic with a curable disease. We had new meds. We had a committed healthcare force. And we had lots of great community-based organizations that were working with the population who live with hep C, but we weren't all working together and simultaneously. And so there's this, um, this um, framework called collective impact, which I had not heard of. Um, and to me, it's quite logical. It's really just um, a very purposeful and structured approach to collaborative work that can be used to tackle deeply entrenched social and social problems. Um, at its core, it really values collective decision making, community based leadership, uh, data sharing and data driven decision making and ongoing evaluation and improvement. Um, and so in terms of the work we did always tried to stay true to the principles of collective impact. Um, so how we designed this organization was um, was uh, using this general structure. So, and, and this changed many times over the first two years of the existence of NTEP CSF. Um, we, we envisioned having lots of different work, well, having multiple work groups um, that would focus on sort of different aspects of our approach. And then we wanted to have, of course, sort of a, a central group to which the work groups would report. So we created three work groups, um, the research and surveillance work group, which was focused largely on um, epidemiology, understanding the scope of the problem, and also uh, supporting uh, independent research that would be aiming to uh, work on problems related to what we were looking at. We had a prevention testing and linkage work group. This was largely um, comprised of people from community-based organizations who were working directly with patients and people affected and impacted by hepatitis C. So um, many consumers participated in the pre prevention testing and linkage work group and many representatives from different organizations who are working with people who use drugs and people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and then there's the treatment access work group um, of which I was co-chair and um, comprised largely of medical providers and pharmacists really thinking about how and where we could um, make access to treatment available. And also doing a lot of work sort of on along the advocacy lines when it came to um, accessing medication um, in situations where we might not have otherwise been able to access. So we also focused a lot on working at the state level and with our local managed care organizations to improve the collaborations and the policies to make medications accessible. Um, those work groups all reported to what was called the coordinating committee um, and had about 15 of us who um, represented both institutions and organizations from across San Francisco. We also then, um, we really wanted to engage some of the sort of quote unquote big wigs, like, you know, presidents or chief medical officers of other healthcare organizations, members from our city government, 
uh, but found, you know, these aren't people who are going to be sort of on a day to day, week to week doing the grunt work. Um, and so we created the executive advisory committee of people who were interested and supportive, who could be key informants and help to support decisions um, that would support our work. But um, they really focused or they operated in an advisory capacity. And then consumer advocates is here on the right and, you know, it looks like it's its own group and it really is not really the idea there is that consumers and community members were really participating at all other levels um, in the work groups in the coordinating committee and also, um, you know, supporting um, the work and getting the word out to people who are impacted who might benefit from the work. And it was with this structure that we thought elimination could be possible and the program grew. So. As of about uh, about a, the last year, we had um, over 150 individuals who were participating in NHFC on a regular basis, um, comprised of people representing over 34 um, community organizations who signed on officially to be supportive members of this organization. Um, this didn't mean they were providing with any funding or anything like that. It simply meant that they were, um, you know, either dedicating resources or collaborating on projects, testing initiatives, treatment initiatives. Um, and names don't mean quite so much if you're not familiar with the landscape of San Francisco, but really representing a very broad um, spectrum of health court organizations, community-based organizations, social justice-focused organizations. We didn't think a lot about funding. I mean, this this did evolve over time. You know, we we realized that some of some of the things we wanted to do would take money, uh, but largely we were depending on people working sort of in kind, using time. Um, and a lot of us were already doing this work in some capacity for the organizations we worked for, um, and wanted to really just align our work and prioritize um, goals together. Um, so we did, though, um, in 2016, get initial seed funding from the Department of Public Health. Um, and then shortly thereafter from the San Francisco Cancer Initiative, which is affiliated with UCSF. Um, and then we did get funding from Abvi, the Hellman Foundation in Gilead as well, um, to support small grants that we wrote to do certain specific projects, uh, some of which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. So the next number of slides share some of our successes um, in various domains. And so community education was really at its core. Like I said, we really wanted to engage community members and speak directly to people impacted by hepatitis C. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure we've all experienced like handing a patient a flyer and the flyer just doesn't, you know, it's either not at the right literacy level or the, the photos aren't representative of, you know, what the patient's experience is like. And so we created a large um, campaign called New Treatments Have Changed the Game because we believed that the new medications were game changers. Um, and we created these um, flyers and these um, educational resources that, you know, targeted various populations and various demographics. Um, and so that was a, a large part of the work that the community um, education work was focused towards. Um, consumers were very involved in making sure that the messaging was um, appropriate for the people who would be consuming or reading the materials. Um, we had at least biannual community meetings, meaning, um, you know, on an evening or a weekend, we would open up a, a, a facility, you know, to community members and we would have um, speakers do like a panel. So we would do like ask a doctor questions and patients would, or not patients, people would come and be able to ask questions or share their own experiences. Um, these were really um, very warm and very inspiring events um, and were really popular and helped to sort of build a very strong support network of people who lived with or had lived with and experienced um, hepatitis C. Um, and then in 2017, we um, completed a video series, uh, or 2018, we completed a video series um, comprised of, I think, four final um, videos um, that are available on the NHFCSF website that are pretty, I was watching them last night and it's just getting very sentimental, but um, we uh, got a grant to um, hire a filmmaker who put together these four videos um, that were, you know, meant to both educate the public as well as potential people who could benefit from um, our work. 
In terms of our testing strategy, really at its core, the idea was that um, recognizing that there's a large gap in people um, who were at risk for hepatitis C and knew they had hepatitis C. Um, and so we integrate, the aim was to integrate hepatitis C testing into places where people um, who use drugs access services. Um, a lot of the work was focusing on better engagement for people who use drugs. Um, and so we worked with community organizations to make testing regular and accessible at homeless shelters, in jail, in our single room occupancy hotels, um, at our syringe service programs, at our treatment drug, you know, drug treatment programs, um, among our transgender population, and also at our STD clinic in San Francisco. But it isn't enough to know that you're positive. I mean, that can go really far, but um, how did we get those people who tested positive into care? And so one of the um, really great successes that we had was development of a community navigator program. And so this is where funding from um, some of those organizations that I mentioned earlier came into play. So we were able to fund um, a longitudinal community navigator program that involved um, three community-based organizations who recruited peers. Um, and we were um, instrumental in educating and creating a, creating a curriculum and educating the peers so that they could serve as community navigators. And then these peers were involved both in the testing as well as in the navigation piece. So people who tested positive could be assisted to get to an organization where they might get treated um, and be able to take care of their, to take care and cure their hepatitis C. So then treatment access that I wanna focus on a little bit more, um, this is where my work was really focused. Um, and so initially when it started, you know, I started on my own treaty to my own primary care practice. Um, and as I met with Katie and Annie and we started to think about how we could scale up treatment, we realized that um, treatment in primary care had to become the standard of care. Um, there's really, there are great studies now, not that we did, but that other people across the country did that showed that treatment in primary care is safe and effective, arguably in many cases more effective often because you can effectively engage the people who need treatment most in a way that allows them to remain engaged and to make it through treatment and be cured. Um, but it is safe, it's effective, and really it should be the standard of care. And so um, a big focus was making hepatitis C treatment accessible across the primary care networks in San Francisco. Um, we did that um, largely um, partnering with the San Francisco Department of Public Health, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but also by working with other healthcare organizations, um, both private and, and, and public, um, to do academic detailing, to um, you know, speak to department heads and ask, you know, in, convince them that this is something that they should invest in in terms of time and education for their providers um, to empower their providers to be treating as well. And then after a while, we realized that treatment in primary care was important, but not enough. Um, and so then the work really pivoted and, you know, we kind of had, not that we had cured all hepatitis C in primary care by any means, but we realized that um, we still were missing a really important um, segment of the population. Um, and so we had to get creative and we had to think out of the box. And so a large part of the work that I worked on for the last couple of years was you know, we spent a couple of years being like, we got to treat in primary care, we got to treat in primary care. And then we said, we need to get out of primary care. It's not about primary care anymore. We don't want treatment in primary care. Not that we didn't want it, but we wanted it outside as well. And so this was some of the really fun and successful stuff was um, bringing treatment into our um, OTPs where people were getting methadone and buprenorphine, uh, treating people in jail, treating people at our syringe service programs, also in residential drug treatment, um, treating, pe treating people who were engaging um, either on the street or the shelter with our street medicine team, uh, bringing treatment into our permanent supportive housing. And then um, UCSF got a van in the last two years and making treatment mobile. Uh, so the idea really being that um, just treat first, like wherever you are going, you should be able to access treatment. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the successes from that perspective. So um, this work that I've been talking about with NHEP CSF, this was a, a big part of what I did, but it really wasn't my job. Um, it wasn't any of our jobs, but it was something we all felt was important and was passionate and was synergistic to what our sort of day jobs were, so to speak. So um, in my work for the Department of Public Health, I was um, a primary care provider much of the time. Um, and I also had done a lot of quality improvement work that had nothing to do with hepatitis C. Um, and as I was working 
uh, as I was treating hepatitis C, I, I mentioned first I was treating my own patients, and then I started treating my colleagues' patients. And frankly, um, I realized after a couple months that you know I would I would say, oh, I'm going to see Joe Smith tomorrow in clinic, and the day before, or whatever, I would prep the chart and I would look at it, and I would think, okay, so. Now I understand what's going on. Well, I'll see Mr. Smith tomorrow and I'll, I'll make a decision about treatment. And I started to find that like the content of a face-to-face -face visit with a patient had no impact on how I treated their hepatitis C. You know, if somebody could decide that a patient was ready and appropriate for treatment, the actual decision-making around what med to use, how long to treat them for, what labs were needed, that was very algorithmic and becoming easier by the day because these new medications were just very straightforward. Um, and so after doing this for a while and working with colleagues um, and having the support of the Department of Public Health who really wanted to expand access to treatment, we realized, you know, we don't need to make a specialty hep C treatment clinic or anything like that. We need to make it so that every primary care doctor or provider can treat. Um, and they, you know, they don't, it's not realistic. It was a rapidly changing field too. There was new meds getting approved every six to 12 months by the FDA. So it was hard to imagine that every single provider was gonna remain up to date on the current knowledge that they needed to treat hepatitis C. You know, I will fully admit I've like never warmed up to the new diabetes medications. Like I still like they scare me. And so I, I empathize with people who were like, you know, a little um, overwhelmed by the idea of learning about these new hepatitis C medications. Um, you know, if you didn't speak the world of HIV, the names of the medications was confusing. If you talked about like mechanisms and pharmacology, it just was not a world that most primary care providers lived in or understood. But in terms of the patients getting the meds, side effects, taking it, the meds being successful, like that was all very easy. So we had this idea that um, we would build an electronic consult system um, where primary care providers could submit a case electronically and have case reviewed with recommendations given that would specify you know, what regimen to use, how long to treat, how to advise the patient in terms of side effects, you know, what labs needed to be done and in what time frame. We staffed this with um, a PharmD, like a pharmacist and a primary care doctor. Um, for all of us, this was a very small fraction of our time, probably, um, you know, about a tenth of our, our total time. Um, and we found that we were very effective we were very effective in being able to make recommendations and never needing to actually see the patient. And this electronic consult system we had, we didn't build the electronic consult system. I mean, it was pre-existing within um, the DPH UCSF um, partnership. And it was something that was being used for other specialties as well. Um, and so what we really asked primary care providers to identify is, is this somebody you feel comfortable treating? Um, that you um, have done the basic labs that are um, outlined here on the right. And then we had exclusion criteria, recognizing that not everybody is safe or appropriate for primary care. And so we had some exclusion criteria. And if the patients met any of those criteria, they would get referred on to liver clinic. Um, and so we, um, we rolled this out in early 2016. And sort of what was really important about it is that it didn't require a face-to-face -face visit. It empowered the primary care provider to treat on their own. One of our sort of secondary aims was to make ourselves obsolete. <laughs> we hoped that over time, as PCPs submitted referrals and got recommendations, that they would learn, this would be an educational mechanism that would allow them to learn how to treat on their own and maybe in the future they would not need to. Now, that, you know, that happened for many, that didn't happen for others, and that was totally okay. Um, uh, you know, we didn't just roll this out overnight with no context. Uh, we did have multiple large trainings. We trained over 156 clinical staff, both um, physicians, NPs, and PAs who were actually providing the direct primary care. Uh, but also we trained nurses working in all the clinics in our system. We trained pharmacists. We trained um, medical assistants um, who would be often the patient, the people interacting with the patients and you know, calling them to come into the labs and working on the prior authorization process to obtain the medication. We also, um, the Department of Public Health is very closely intertwined with UCSF, uh, which had two primary care um, training programs. And so we were doing ongoing trainings with the residents, um, trying to 
to build up the future workforce. And then we did a lot of work directly with each clinic. The San Francisco Department of Public Health has 15 primary care clinics um, that it operates. And so we did a lot of one-on-one -on -one support, um, helping them identify and cultivate champions at each clinic, providing them with like registries, lists of patients who had hepatitis C to give them data um, and being able to support some like data review to make sure that people were getting labs appropriately. So we did a, um, we did a, I have some data about the success of this. Um, like I said before, <laughs> data has been a struggle. Um, the Department of Public Health um, does not have great data systems. We did not have a singular EHR until um, really after all of this was well underway. Um, we were using various um, EHRs and paper-based systems um, in different settings, which made it really hard to sort of track the effect of what we were doing. That being said, um, we, we rolled out the e-referral system in February of 2016, and in that same initial period, we held multiple trainings and started providing the technical assistance um, to support clinics at the individual level, like I talked about. Um, and so we did an analysis um, that we published in 2018. So um, really, all the numbers not being particularly important, but looking um, sort of pre-intervention versus post-intervention, um, two, two numbers stand out. One is that the total number of patients treated increased by 112%. Um, so a significant increase in the number of patients being treated by primary care providers before and after. And then also um, the number of clinics treating uh, increased by 140%, and that being important, and I think that had more downstream effects because we got more providers across more settings treating. So by the end, every clinic had people treating, maybe not every provider, but um, it really meant that any clinic you were going to was the right place for you to be if you wanted to get treated. Uh, we had a new data source. Um, and I've been currently working with um, some pharmacists at the Department of Public Health. Um, we were able to access EHR prescribing records. So that earlier data was sort of in that Perry 2016 period, like you know, the year before 2016 and about two years after 2016. This data is a little later. This is looking January 2017 to August 2019. Um, and it pulled patients based on having had a medication prescribed through the EHR. And then we excluded patients who were being treated in liver clinic and who were being treated in the dedicated HIV clinic. Um, and showed that in that um, year and a half period, 617 patients were treated in primary care in the San Francisco Department of Public Health. About 40% of those were treated using recommendations for, from e-consult. Um, I think had we had this data and looked maybe the two years prior, a higher percentage probably would have been treated by e-consult. Um, again, a testament to the fact that um, we were trying to um, make ourselves obsolete. And, you know, we were aiming to train PCPs so that they didn't need to use the consult anymore. Um, but, um, you know, 40% uh, um, using our, our consult system. And then looking at new starts by year, you can see 2015 through 2018, how many patients per year were initiating treatment in primary care and our cure rates. Um, and so, our numbers overall were going up um, with maybe a dip in 2018, although our data fell off at that point because we lost one of our, um, of our data systems um, that was feeding into this. Um, so I don't know that that's a significant decline truly, um, but really important, you know, we're looking at cure rates of 93, 96, 98 percentage, which is on par with any published data you'll see about the efficacy of these medications. Well, then I talked about getting out of primary care. So um, then we got creative and it got fun. Um, it was really fun in primary care too, honestly. Um, but this was some of the fun stuff because um, I was able to work really closely with some of the community-based programs um, and just do stuff that was really you know, different. Um, and so this is um, just some data, you know, not comprehensive. It um, starts on the, you know, the dates listed on the far right. Um, and then um, goes through March 2019. So, you know, we're already about a year and a half um, old at this point. But looking at um, our hospital-based opiate treatment program that's run by the County of San Francisco, uh, we had 153 patients um, treated there in this time frame from August 2016 through March 2019. 
Um, and I know that they have continued to make great strides with the aim of treating everybody at that OTP. Uh, we were able to treat 100 patients in the San Francisco County Jail. This was done through a partnership with Gilead, who provided drug, because patients who are in jail do not have access to Medicaid, and so we couldn't access drug otherwise. But it was a feasibility study to show that if you had access to medications, it could be a, a, a effective time and um, structure in which to treat. Um, and it was effective and it was very, very hard because of the dynamic nature of people coming and going from jail. Um, and we had to have navigation as a really core component to help people remain engaged as they left the jail setting. Uh, we began treating at um, one of our large residential drug treatment programs run by a program called Health Right 360. Um, we were treating at um, a syringe access program run by the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. And I have more data on the next slide about that. And then our street-based team and our shelter-based team treating patients who they were engaging with exclusively on the streets or in the shelters. So overall, and again, this is just a, a snapshot of a time frame, but um, you know, at least 417 patients initiated treatment. And these are people who um, you know, would have probably been great candidates for primary care-based treatment, except for the fact that they weren't coming into primary care, and it's why we realized we needed to get out of primary care in addition to being in primary care. So the treatment at um, our AIDS Foundation syringe access program is a really, you know, a shining example of how being innovative can be successful. Um, the the syringe service program is um, run in conjunction with the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, and they had a, a nurse practitioner who was working at sort of a traditional four wall clinic that they operated, and he was very interested in bringing treatment to this setting. Um, and I remember meeting with him before he ever did it, and he seemed so naive and so clueless, frankly. Um, and I remember thinking like, there's so many reasons why this may not work well. Um, but I guess I didn't dissuade him too much because he jumped right in and he partnered very um, closely with uh, one of our um, you know, con former consumers and um, very uh, foundational members of NHEP CSF. And they created this amazing program based out of the syringe service program where they had an NP on site for a half day a week. Um, they were providing testing to nearly everybody who came through the, the program um, in terms of like you know, are you antibody positive or not? Um, over this 2017 to 2019 period, they screened 166 people for treatment, meaning they met one on one. They had 166 people meet directly with the nurse practitioner um, and think about if treatment um, in this setting would be feasible. Now, um, notably, it wasn't a comprehensive um, clinic. It wasn't a primary care clinic. So they were specifically looking at people who did not have significant other comorbidities and health concerns that might make treatment in that setting unsafe. Um, but of that 166, um, they actually found with follow-up testing that 10% spontaneously cleared. And then they started 129 people on treatment. Um, at the time this data was last um, gathered, they still had um, 28 people on treatment and 11 people who like the meds had been ordered but had not yet been started. But they had had 90 people complete treatment and they had a SVR rate of 71, uh, an SVR rate of 71. So SVR means sustained viral response um, and is the uh, official definition of cure of hepatitis C. So if you do a Hepatitis C viral level 12 weeks after completion and it's undetectable. It means the person's been cured and um, it's important to use the term cure because it truly is a cure. It's not height, it's not laying in weight, it's not in remission. Um, my big soapbox is reading in notes history of hepatitis C um, treated with, or, or the patient, no, sorry, the patient has hepatitis C that was treated with such and such. Well, they don't have hepatitis C if they were cured of the disease. You take that off the problem list. They had a history of it, perhaps, but that's my, my personal pet peeve. Um, so anyways, this, this was an incredible program. Um, it is an incredible program. They um, utilized the fact that people were coming in regular for syringe service, pro, for syringe service materials. They had lockers set up where people who were working um, or getting treatment had a private locker where they could put their meds. They could come in every day. They could come in every week whatever it was, so they had a safe and secure place to store their supplies and their meds. Um, and it was um, a very 
great model that I'm not aware of was being done anywhere else in the country. I think my big take home is, um, uh, and I often say this at the beginning when I talk about hepatitis C, is that um, if nothing else, it's important that you get joy from your work. Um, medicine is a very rewarding and also very stressful profession. Um, and especially when you're working in primary care and you're working perhaps with populations for whom there seem to be barriers to everything all the time, it's nice to have some wins every once in a while. And so um, I would urge you to consider um, bringing hepatitis C treatment into whatever setting you're working in, because it's really one of the most joyful things I've ever done in my life. Um, and it really will give you great um, satisfaction. And more importantly, it gives your patients both, you know, satisfaction, but also an improved quality and quantity of life. Um, so I really urge you to think about adding it to your repertoire. Um, and it's especially relevant if you work with people who have substance use disorders because of the risk factors for living with hepatitis C. So with that, I will um, just acknowledge a number of people, um, countless people who deserve um, thanks, um, but some of the key people listed here. And these pictures on the right are um, from some of our community events where we would um, bring people together, serve pizza, and provide information. So welcome. Any questions, um, nhepcsf.org is a great website. We have our videos. We have you know, our annual reports and a lot of links to um, resources as well there. And then I'll remind you of that dark blue Wisconsin. Um, and I wish that was a, p a political illusion right now, but um, that dark blue Wisconsin about the acute rates of hepatitis C here and a call to that we need to do more here too. Welcome questions if anybody has any. Oh, I'm trying to, let me try to find the chat. I may be seeing that there are chat. Hi, Kelly. Can you... Yes. Hi. Yeah, my name is Wajiha. I um, am part of the Division of Infectious Diseases, and we're currently working towards um, a treatment for acute hep C in um, rural Wisconsin, where, where the rates are among the highest. Um, and it's really nice to hear your uh, presentation because we're doing similar work where we have a community partner at a syringe exchange try to take treatment out of mainstream healthcare and do it at the SSP. Um, but a few things that we were wondering about, like if you had any experience in San Francisco, can you describe what the motivation looked like to get treatment among people who use substance, uh, who uh, use substances, mainly because they're asymptomatic and, you know, it might be hard to get them to, 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 um, to, to treatment or get access to treatment because of the fact that it's not something that they are worrying about right now. Yeah, I mean, I, so I think having it be something they 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 know about is the biggest leap. Um, you know, I'll 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 say that I think this country did a great job of like convincing people that they didn't need or didn't deserve treatment by making it. You know, frankly, the treatment wasn't that good. It wasn't easy to access. access. Um, but once we sort of cross the threshold of um, having there be a, a baseline level of understanding among people affected that like this is a disease that is curable, it's effective, the medication is accessible to you. I think it's important to note that um, there is no longer a prior authorization in the state of Wisconsin for uh, people with Medica Medicaid. Um, so it's quite accessible in that population. Uh, people were really motivated. I mean, people live with great fear and stigma that this is a disease they brought on themselves in that population. Um, and, you know, I often found like it was very hard. I, I would often have trouble engaging people, um, you know, they may not want to stop using drugs at this point in their life. They sure weren't con concerned about their hypertension or their diabetes, but I actually found that people were um, uniquely motivated to uh, have their hepatitis C treatment or have their hepatitis C treated and cured. Um, and so that wasn't universal. There are some people for whom, especially their drug use was just too, um, too active and too uh, too much of a barrier to allow them to engage. But for the most part, most people were really interested in it. And it was a very peer-to-peer -peer driven um, effort where people would see their peers getting treated. And you know, even in my work here in Madison to date, I've had lots of people say to me like, yeah, my boyfriend got treated or my neighbor got treated or my mom got treated. And, and, and that's always said in a positive way. And they're like, yeah, I want that treatment too. So. I'd be happy to think about that with you or anyone. Somebody Perfect. texted or chatted, can they um, see the slides? Yeah, I would be happy to share these slides. 
And then one other question I had was um, among the, sur the the surveillance that you showed from 2016 and 2017 of people uh, of treatment success, um, have surveillance looked like looked at reinfection among that subpopulation? Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> our surveillance is bad. Um, the, the, they're just we had excellent sur surveillance at the city level for HIV and. I think it was a bit of a wake up call that there just isn't the funding or the interest to have um, equivalent surveillance for hepatitis C. So we really struggled to have comprehensive data. Um, but we, and then um, the San Francisco Department of Public Health um, underwent the transition from um, multiple disparate EHRs to EPIC. And so that was a huge upheaval. And we kind of lost a lot of ability to monitor over a two year period because of that literal like electronic shift. Um, and then COVID hit, so it has not been a priority to be surveilling for reinfection. Uh, reinfection is a risk, um, of course, and it does happen. Um, we were actually seeing higher rates of reinfection among MSM who didn't have um, active substance use issues than among people who are using substance use, but um, don't have great data. It does happen, and so I would emphasize that education around reinfection has to be really integral to the treatment plan, um, but people can also get retreated too. So um, overall, I, you know, I think most people aren't. And I've seen, I, and it's all anecdotal, but um, I, I wish somebody would do a study looking at sort of like specific behaviors related to substance use um, pre and post treatment, uh, because I've seen such um, really meaningful shifts in people's um, approach to their own health, to how and what they use in terms of substances and to, um, you know, number of people who've told me, like, I'm finally going to quit smoking cigarettes because I cured my hep C. It's just, like, amazing to me, you know. That's always such a hard one. Um, but people really uh, acting in very different ways, believing that they've been given a new lease on life when they actually probably never before believed that they would have that opportunity. It's really fun too. Like you, you don't get a lot of people who come in so excited about their hypertension or their diabetes. But like people come in and they're like, "You're gonna cure me, and you're gonna cure me in eight weeks," because that's all it takes for almost everybody these days. And it, it is just like a really um, high impact both for you and for the patient's um, opportunity. So it's it's been fun. Well, I welcome any questions. If anybody wants to email me, um, I have uh, a UW email address. If you're on the list to have said, got this email about Grand Round somehow, I'm sure you can track me down. Um, and I'd you know, really be happy to think and work with people um, who are working on this um, here in Wisconsin. Thank you, everybody. And I hope you have a good afternoon.